Welcome back to part three, and our second guest on today's show is Jeremy Lewis. Jeremy's influence on the Liverpool music scene has been evident as the founder of Amazon Studios, Park Street Studios, and as co-owner of Inevitable Records, and more recently as a manufacturer of a range of top quality innovative guitars. So, Jeremy, welcome to Skunks Pop. Nice, nice to be here. It's great to have you on. Um, Jeremy, just, um, just going right back, how, how did you actually start out in music? Was it through the studio route? Um, well, no, well, yeah. I mean, I was, I was in a band, uh, or bands, and um, if you want to hear this story, I mean, basically what <laughs> happened was there was a band in Liverpool called Ibix or I Ibis or something like that. You, yeah. you might know them. Um, the lead singer was Freddie Mercury. <laughs> the guitarist was a guy called Mike Burson. Um, that split up. Freddie went off back to, you know, where he lived down south, somewhere near London. Mike and I got together and formed a band and basically we started doing some demos um, because Mike knew Queen and Ken Testy who was sort of, you know, Eric, the Excellent, guy from yeah. Eric's, yeah, um, also knew them. We ended up going down there, we hung around with them, we uh, basically ended up gigging with them and then our bass player um, had an uh, unfortunate episode and ended up in hospital with a drugs overdose, very mm -hmm. rock and roll. Uh, Ken took over as bass player, so Brian lent him his bass. Um, and then Freddie decided to get us a record deal. So there we were in London. Um, Freddie went to CBS, they turned us down. Then he went to his label, which was EMI. The chairman of EMI took a liking to us and wanted us to sign basically with, with EMI Records. Now at that point, to answer <laughs> your question, I basically decided that we weren't good enough. I mean. Right. We, you know, we were, we, we were watching Queen, we were playing with Queen, we were hanging out with them, and quite frankly, they were amazing, and we weren't, as far as I was concerned. So I had a kind of crossroads in front of me, and I decided to go down the studio route. Mm -hmm. Already done a four-track studio at home, Deaf School had recorded there, Big in Japan right. had recorded there, was enjoying that, so I kind of split up the band, to, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, at that point, because of... Freddie really getting us that deal and um, went into the recording side um, and you know the usual story sell your car borrow some money took over the assets of a, of a sort of failing studio on the outskirts of nowhere basically in yeah. Simmonswood near Kirby and uh, started from there didn't have a clue what we were doing of course so, but so Freddie Mercury changed all life he did he really did. yeah it he was did. down to Freddie I mean it was very nice of him to do that <laughs> for us I mean they were great you know great great guys I mean he lent us the bass yeah. You know, they got us a record. I mean, what more could you, you ask? But, you know, at the end of the day, that's when it, you, it's, it's one of these things where be careful what you wish for. Mm. That, that's, that was it really with me. So you started off with a, a record, um, a recording studio. Uh, yeah. Did you know anything about recording studios at that time? Not really. No, no, no not, <laughs> not at all. We just had a pile of equipment, um, nice old upright piano in the corner, which we'll probably talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, which sounded great, that piano. Um, and, you know, this sort of, we, we had a, um, a homemade desk made by a guy, you know, an electronics engineer in, in Liverpool called Peter Coglin. We, he had also converted a NASA signal data machine, of all things, to record instead of get data from outer space. Um, it was completely non-standard. It was eight foot tall. It was green. And we called it the Jolly Green Giant. And we had to chain it to the wall because otherwise it would have fallen on top of us. And in the winter, basically because it was valve, um, to warm up the room, we just opened, opened the drawers and went like that. <laughs> Great. Did you get any signals from outer space? Or well, we, <laughs> I, I don't, we may have done that. <laughs> it's have. quite possible. And, and all kinds of strange yeah. things were happening in those yeah. days. So you, you got, you've started off, you've got your studio at Amazon. You're starting to record some really good bands up there. It's starting to well, pick up. Well, yeah, I mean... Not just Cy Tucker. Yeah, well, <laughs> because, I mean, th there was only one... I mean, the reason why I wanted to do that, really, and, and start a studio is because... I was pretty appalled by the, by the state of the music scene in Liverpool, really. Mm. Um, there was no music scene. There yeah. was absolutely nothing. It was a wasteland. It was like, was it, was, it was really the backlash of the 60s going mm. on. And I really had this idea to try and do something about it, at least from my end, through recording and providing facilities. And really, for the first two, two years or three years or so, really, it was just Cy Tucker and the Friars, you know. Mm. 
and people like that coming in and you know Jerry Marsden and and the searchers and and you know all the comedians and you know we did we did Bill Shankly we did, you know and people <laughs> like that you know I mean all you know, doing monologues and the Liverpool football team you know we did all these sort of people yeah. but we weren't really doing any sort of uh, innovative music but mm -hmm. that did come yeah. things did start to change because at the time that we were sort of getting our feet under uh, under the table there was this movement as you know going on in Liverpool yeah. with all these other acts and people playing in cellars and getting together and uh, something was happening and, and of course you sort of start to tap into that type of area and start off with inevitable records with Pete yeah, Fulwell well, How? It, yeah I mean Pete Fulwell who was at, um, at Eric's Club with Ken Testy, our old bass yeah. player, yeah. Um, basically came to me and said, look, let's start a label. I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. So we, we started preparing to, to start this label. That is until we got a call from Tony Wilson over in, mm. uh, <laughs> over in Manchester, who'd booked a hotel room, and he'd called us all formally to this meeting. And the meeting basically was myself, Pete Fulwell, Roger Eagle from, from Eric's, Excellent. Tony, I think Martin Hannett, the producer, Joy wow. Division's producer, was there, uh, and so on. And he said, well, look, I've got Joy Division. You've got, um, you know, Pete Wiley, why he dead or alive. Um, yeah, we had China a few. Crisis, yeah, yeah. well, we, they, they were later on. They later were a bit on. later on. We had a few other, few other acts. And, um, but then Pete piped up and said, well, actually, we've got all these acts that were going through, you know, Eric's at the mm. time, and we've got a list of them here. So we've got... <laughs> Um, you know, Elvis Costello, Buzz Cox, The Clash, Joy Division, Ramon, Sex Pistols, Susie and the Banshees, The Stranglers, Ultravox, Wyatt, um, you know, and so it goes wow. on. You Order, um, Orchestral Maneuvers, U2, Mick Hucknall. Now, all of these they bands went. were going through Eric's. Now, yeah. a lot of, probably 50% of the names that I've just mentioned were yeah. unsigned. Were unsigned. Thanks. So Pete's idea yeah. was to offer the label to to you know to, to those acts, so Tony said, "Well, let's do a Northwest label and take on you know take on the the, the London labels," yeah. and you know we had George. So basically, we could have had you know if, if some of those acts that were unsigned at the time would have yeah. would have come with us, and maybe some would, who knows? We could have had this amazing um, label, but basically, we sat in that room, load of egos, and we couldn't agree on the name. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Tony wanted to call it Factory. We wanted to call it Inevitable. Classic. So we said, well, Inevitable Factory, Factory Inevitable. Then it just all blew up. Everyone got the hump and walked off, and that was it. He did Factory, and we did Inevitable. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry I, I have to chuckle at that, but, but you know, you're thinking about some of the iconic bands that what could have happened. Oh, it's just but, unbelievable. So, but, so it's one of those points yeah. in time, you know, no one was signed. No. And here was a label willing to sign people yeah. and do something. And, and the bands that you had on the label, I mean, they were quite diverse. Again, they, 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 there wasn't a theme coming through. Was, yeah. was there anything particular about the bands on the label that you were looking for? Because you had, you had, well, Pete Burns, you had Dead or Alive, you had War, yeah. the China Crisis. Later they're on they're, they're certainly not, they're not similar in any way. So no, I mean, uh, you know, I, th I think it's fair to say that, that sort of War and, and um, Dead or Alive and Nightmares and Wax, which we started with, um, were sort of more, it came more from the sort of Eric side of things mm. and Pete side of things. And then later on, China Crisis were sort of more me and through the studio and so on. Um, but no, there was no theme. Um, we heard something we liked. It We sounded a bit like Jeff, really, mm. Probe Records. I mean, it's just, you like something, you sign it. That's the beauty of um, independent labels. I mean, you don't have to go through all that rigmarole of, yeah. of you know, <laughs> a performance for A&R and all that sort of no. thing. You just do it. You just go in the next day and make the record. So know. there was no vision or business plan for the label? No, it was just, not at all. We like no. it. Yeah, we just we'll you know, like out. something, let's record it, go in. And the immediacy of all of that, I think, is what you can hear in the music. I think that's, mm. that's what it was all about. Mm. And of course, you, you start to translate over from being owner of a studio to actually producing things. I've just got this one here. This is a fabulous one. I think this is um, oh, it's my favourite China Crisis track, uh, Scream Down At Me. Yeah. Uh, so you, you started to go into production. How did you uh, well, make that transition, really? Well, I mean, I play guitar. Um, I've always been involved in music. Um, you know, I you know, was involved in, in recording music, so it was a natural transition. For, to, the problem really with me was that I didn't really have the time to take a production mm. career seriously, you know, labels, mm. studios, all the rest of it. I would have had to sort of really concentrate on that. So I did some production. I ended up, you know, producing a few artists and, and mixing. So I, I even ended up 
uh, mixing a Black Sabbath album, you know, and working with them. Um, That's an interesting. You know, just, just really almost by accident. Um, so I think all sorts of strange things happened, but I enjoyed it, um, yeah. but I didn't give enough time to it, I think. And the, the label starts to do you know, well, because, it, again, you think of the artists that you had on the label. Mm. So, um, was there any point you thought about selling it out completely? And well, yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, what had happened was that Pete had taken uh, Wiley and, and Wah over to Warner Brothers and done the big record deal. Mm. Um, I wanted to take a different route and realised that we couldn't really finance it. It's a bit like Jeff said, you know, you need, you need some money to finance, mm. and he found some money from, from ASOS and mm. financed it to get it going properly. We needed to do the same, really, but the only route for us was, was through the major labels. So we went and saw a few, and we ended up with Virgin. So we sat down with, with Virgin um, to do the, uh, the label deal mm. for Inevitable, which very nearly didn't happen because we discovered that Branson didn't have any money basically, yeah. to sign us. Right, because it's interesting because this one's actually got Inevitable Records and Virgin on yeah. the same one. Yeah. So this was obviously a transition. Yeah, that was a transition, yeah. Should um, I keep hold of that then? Jeremy? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's probably going to be worse than money. Um, it, the originals of uh, African and White and stuff like that are probably, you know, vinyl probably will end up being worth some money, especially on Ine Inevitable Records, the original. Yeah. There was a release before Virgin. Right. That's the one that would be that's the valuable. That's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, we're going to come back in uh, in part four and mm. talk a little bit more about some of the other things that you've done in music mm. and have a look at your uh, your new range of guitars. Yeah, great. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. Welcome back to part four. On this edition of Scouse Pop, we're talking to Jeremy Lewis, co-founder of Inevitable Records, Amazon Studios, and Par Street Studios. So Jeremy, going back to your, you know, your studio involvement, uh, before we move on to Par Street, mm. could you tell us about some of the most noticeable things that happened to you at Amazon? Well, um, I think I mentioned that I ended up working with Black Sabbath by, by accident um, in, I think it was 1989. Um, and I've got to say that probably at the time, it was just like a job, you know, for me at the time, because they'd made a bit of a pig's ear of, of the mix. And when they left, and they were a bit disappointed, this was uh, Tony Iommi and Cozy Powell. When they left, um, I got hold of the tapes and kind of sorted it all out and then sent them a cassette. Mm. And they went, wow, it's fantastic. Come back in the studio with us and mix mm. this and do this and blah, blah, blah. And at the time, I just thought, well, I didn't want the studio to look bad, which is really why I did it. But when I look back, you know, there was Tony Iommi, mm -hmm. sort of the godfather of heavy metal, really. Um, Cozy Powell, probably one of the most iconic drummers of, yeah. of, of the 70s, really, and the 80s. Um, and Brian May was doing a solo, you know, had done a solo on one of the, you know. And so I was thinking, wow. my God, you know, I was working with these yeah, people. Yeah. And then, of course, hairs on the back of the neck time, well, you know, being in, in the room with when they were mixing, say, Hole of the Moon by, by the Water Boys stands out for me. I don't know why, but it, it just mm. does. But I think the moment has got to be when um, EMI sent up all the Beatles back catalogue in multi-track for us to copy. Yeah. So, so basically, you, you'd be sitting there, um, you'd put on the tape, go like that with the faders, and then John Lennon would, would perk up and say, all right, you know, Wow. One, two, I am the, you know, sometimes oh. I am the walrus or something. And you're actually mixing the Beatles oh. it, out of Abbey Road. You know, we weren't <laughs> supposed to be mixing the Beatles, I might say. <laughs> we're supposed to be copying the Beatles yeah. to another format because we had all these different formats. But that wasn't a session, but that was really quite extraordinary because we got to hear the multi-tracks and actually mix them and mess around with them and oh. solo all the Beatles on the desk. Oh. Um, you know, 
Unbelievable. Was, what could he say? I don't think he gets any better than that, really. No, it doesn't get really. any better than I that, really. should stop the interview yeah, right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, moving from Amazon to Parr Street, well, yeah. why did that move happen? Was that an inevitable...? Well, yeah, well, yeah, it was. I mean, we were... You know where we were. Yeah, I mean, we were we right out on the sticks. <laughs> now, my partner at the time um, was Tony Smith of... Well, he managed Genesis, Genesis and Phil yeah. Collins, etc. Yeah. And... Um, I said to him, look, we've really, you know, one way or another, we've got to move into the centre of Liverpool because we can't, this is too mm -hmm. ridiculous, we can't. And I had this vision to do this sort of mega studio mm -hmm. with, with uh, four studios, a uh, restaurant and bar, a hotel, you know, mm -hmm. 12 suites hotel. And then the top floor, we were going to do this, uh, this thing with the offices for like-minded people. Originally, the studios were going to be in the Royal Institution in Colquitt Street. Mm -hmm. uh, the council gave us a grant of about 250,000 all in to, to help us with that. The deal to buy the property fell through. We ended up moving down the road uh, about 200 yards, which actually was a more suitable building uh, mm. to an old printing works in Parr Street. Mm. And we moved Amazon there. But unfortunately, the council reneged on their grant, oh, right. which, which kind of <laughs> scuppered, you know, partly scuppered the project from, from the beginning. So um, the deal to do that, um, Tony said, come down to his offices, which are in Walton Street in London. And he said, look, uh, we've got an idea. I said, yeah, great. He said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you a million quid from Genesis Pension Fund. And we literally worked out a deal on the back of a cigarette packet. Um, no contract, nothing. And literally within two days, I had a million pounds to start the project. Wow. And that's how it started. Wow. So, I mean, Parr Street, again, uh, inevitable um, records. You've had all of those recordings at Amazon. And then Parr Street goes from strength to strength. Stre well, yeah, I mean, Parr, Parr Street sort of became one of the iconic studios. I mean, it was Amazon Studios, of course, originally. That's what it, But it, it was renamed Parr Street later on. And, you know, the, 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 the list of, of people who've been there is just quite astonishing. Just oh, you've probably got... Consult the... Well, I mean... Just, I mean Diana Ross, I mean... The Spice Girl, you know, and all these people. Most of them after I left, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, you know, unbelievable. Uh, you know what, the, the, the heritage the of the place. I've got yeah. Coldplay, Rihanna, yeah. Morrissey, yeah. Justin Bieber. That, I don't know whether that was a mistake. Barry Manilow. Yeah, <laughs> Barry Manilow. <laughs> You've got yeah. all of the amazing. And, of yeah. course, um, I mean, this has become an award-winning studio. Yeah. And some of the staff that you, you employed as well became award-winning staff. I mean, some of the names, I don't know whether you could just tell us about how you manage those staff, because there's some fantastic, you know, Grammy Award winning yeah. uh, people that you've, you've really nurtured. Well, um, Gil Norton, who ended up, you know, now produces the Foo Fighters, Killers, I think, and, mm. you know, he did James and people like that. Gil came to us on a youth opportunity scheme in Kirby, just as a young kid, basically. And like everyone who came to see me looking for a job in the studio was just desperate you know gives a job gives a job you know mm. just just really desperate to get involved in music and I think it's that sort of desperation and keenness which sort of wins out in the end yeah I mean Gil did eventually get his job on mm. his youth opportunity mm. scheme and when that ended we kept him on as a, as a tape up and then he got his big break with Echo and the Bunnymen mm. where he just happened to be you know in the room and took over almost by default mm. as the engineer for Ocean Rain one of the you wow. know probably their best album really mm. And then, of course, Ken Nelson as well. Ken Nelson was in a band. Ken came to see me, said, you know, can I do some tape hopping, you know. Um, he's hanging around the studios all the time, you know, constantly harassing me to give him the job. Eventually, I gave him a tape hop job up in Amazon in Simmonswood. Um, he started doing some, some tape hopping work and the odd bit of engineering. Then he went away and did his own studio, Ken, actually, for a year or two. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved down to Parr Street, he came back in finished with his own studio and asked me again you know can I come back and do some so I gave him a, a, another you know another go and uh, he went straight in as an engineer this time and then he ended up winning two Mercury music prizes Gomez I've forgotten the other act um, and then of course he ended up being on the Coldplay album Right, well, you've gone from studio. Now, I, I, I'm going to finish the show with a bit of uh, your latest venture, and mm. I'm just looking at it over there, and I'm getting quite excited about it, actually. You, you've, you've gone into manufacturing a, a really exclusive range of, of guitars. There's, like, mm. no other guitar in the world. Could you tell mm. us something about it? And we'll well, have a look at this guitar. I mean, the, Security, what, please, yeah, just... Yeah, what <laughs> happened was that, that basically I, I was listening to the radio, 
about 1998. I kept hearing this track come on the radio. I kept hearing this piano on the track, and I said, I know that piano, it's my old piano. Remember the upright I mentioned? Yeah. That's my old piano. I know that's my piano, I'm gonna find out about that track. So I did, and sure enough, it was my old piano. It was in Studio Three at Par Street, and the band was Coldplay, and it was their first single. And that got me thinking about the way that pianos are made with the string strung across a steel frame in the wood, and how amazingly, you know, characterful, mm. it, it, for want of a better word, they sound, full of overtones and sustain. And I recognise that particular mm. piano off the radio. I mean, yeah. that's how individual they are. So I went on to do a dot-com company and, you know, property mm. portfolio and all kinds of stuff. But 10, 12 years later, um, I was, you know, finished. I'd sold a dot-com company. And I'd always thought about that. And I'd always thought about trying to do a guitar in a totally different way. And I woke up one morning and did it. What's special about well, this guitar? Well, it's one piece. I mean, it's one piece of wood. The wood has been basically in the bottom of the Belize River and lagoons in South America for about 150 years. So there's no resin in the wood. Um, it was probably growing for anything up to you know 800 years before that, so maybe 1,200 or something like that. So we're the only people in the UK who, who have a license to import this wood. And then what I did, in this one piece of wood, I put a titanium chassis, mm -hmm. which goes from the nut here, which we also invented, by the way, it's a new type of blocking nut, right through to the Atlantic Bridge here, mm -hmm. and it, they connect both ends. Mm -hmm. That enables the neck, which is incredibly thin, um, to be very, very strong. It's one of the thinnest necks of any guitar in the world, but it's also probably the strongest. Mm. Um, the Atlantic Bridge, is, we call that because it moves with no moving parts. It moves in a linear way using mm. flexure technology. The pickups have one coil per string. They use quadratic diffusion technology to produce a very good acoustic sound that diffuses the mid-range, borrowed from the studios. Mm. The frets are tungsten carbide, um, 9.5 on the MOS scale, diamonds are 10, so basically they'll out outlive the human race. They're incredible to play over because they, you know, they just, they just really, are really, really slippy, basically, unlike, you know, normal frets. Once you've played this, you can't really go back. And the acoustic sound is just loud. You know, that's the sound of the, the sound of the guitar. And it just goes on and on and on. So what I thought was, let's make a guitar where the acoustic sound and you know, the attributes of the, the sound before you mic it up are really, really good and plenty of overtones and yeah. sustain. Wow. And then it will sound great and it does. Well, it looks fantastic. I think it's a bit out of my price range. I'm having one of those spinal tap moments mm. when I'm looking at the guitar and thinking... Yeah, it goes up to 11. Can, it, does it yeah. go up to 11? Yeah, it does and go up to 11, yeah. Can I play it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming in today, Jeremy. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure to listen to all your stories from the studios, from the record label days, mm. and to have a look at this fan... What's it called, by the way, this It's called the guitar? JJL1. J uh, <laughs> one because there's only one of them because no, no because it's, it's one piece it's basically. one piece yeah one piece of wood yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay just remains to me to say thank you very much to jeremy lewis for coming in and taking the time to discuss his career in music thank, thank you, you very much jeremy. thank you <laughs>